It seems a misnomer to call this chapter a journey of the second degree, as the second degree is itself a journey. In fact, it is the Masonic journey. The first represents sunrise, birth, beginning. The third represents sunset, death, or the end. But the second represents the rhyme between sunrise and sunset, between birth and death, the distance between the beginning and the end. However, it is intended to conduct the reader through the second degree, following the order of the ceremony, touching on its highlights, and adding some interpretation and explanation, as we did in the first degree. As we make this journey, let us keep in mind that the main aim and purpose of the second degree, which is to inculcate the importance of developing the intellectual faculty, so that its attainments may lift us to a truer and fuller appreciation of the wonderful works of the Almighty Creator. In the second degree, the lodge is opened on the square, that great Masonic emblem of the golden rule, of doing unto others, as in similar cases, we would wish that they should do to us, or as we Freemasons put it, of acting on the square. This is the way of life that Freemasonry teaches, and has ever taught, that is, to so harmonize our conduct in this life as to render us acceptable to that divine being, from whom all goodness springs. It is thus fitting that the candidate for the second degree should gain admission by the assistance of the square. In the first degree, the brethren are asked to take notice that the candidate is about to pass in view before them. But in this degree, the word now is added. It is now about to pass in view before them, reminding us that now is the time to remember our Creator, and that now is the time to perform our allotted task while it is yet day. In the second degree, the sun is always at its meridian. The predominating number of this degree is five, and so the candidate advances to the east by five steps, as though ascending a winding staircase. The winding staircase, to my mind, is the greatest symbol in the second degree. However, we will deal with that when the time comes to the tracing board, and then you can judge for yourself. As the candidate kneels for the obligation, the number five again predominates, for in doing so he forms five squares thus, first with his right leg, second with his left leg, third with his right hand, the fourth with his left arm, and the fifth with his body. In numerology, five is the number of social relations, thus identifying it with the Masonic square, and the five points of fellowship. But that, of course, belongs to the third degree. In the secrets we are told, for it was this position that Moses prayed fervently to the Almighty. This alludes to the line when the army of Israelites under the command of Joshua were engaged in battle with the Amalekites. Now, even though they were greatly outnumbered, the Almighty had assured Moses that the Israelites would prevail, as long as Moses held up his hands in this position as a sign of prayer and a token of the faith of Israel, that numbers were of no importance when the Almighty was on their side. This incident is recorded in Exodus 17:11 through 12 where we read, And it came to pass, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on one side, the other on the other side, and his hands were steady till the going down of the sun. The word of the degree is a Hebrew word, and when conjoined with that in the former degree, forms the key to God's covenant with Israel, as we will readily see. When we repeat the covenant, In the strength of Jehovah shall the king rejoice, for he will establish the throne of David and his kingdom to his seed forever. This is the real importance of the word, the fact that the assistant high priest bore the same name as the pillar is incidental, but it did provide our ancient brethren with a ready means of remembering the name of the pillar. There is no account of the dedication of the temple in the Bible, but that event is amply recorded by the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus in his work Jewish Antiquities. In his account we find that Zadok has become the sole high priest of Israel, whereas in the reign of King David he shared that office with Abiathar. Abiathar, however, was later found guilty of treason by King Solomon for aiding and abetting Adonijah in his abortive attempt to seize the throne. The king could not, of course, put to death anyone who had borne the Ark of the Covenant, but Solomon did banish Abiathar, and that is a last mention of him in the sacred volume. Josephus states quite clearly that Zadok, as the high priest of Israel, officiated at the dedication of the temple, but he makes no mention of an assistant high priest. If he had one, and he probably did, that assistant's name could not have been the same as the southern pillar, because King David appointed a man by the name as one of his 24 section leaders or concourses, as they are called in the sacred volume, when he reorganized the priesthood, and it would be from their ranks that we could expect such a promotion to come. It could well be that one of our Masonic legends has preserved a name that history has recorded nowhere else. Our ritual does not refer to the name Zadok, the high priest, 
but only to that of his assistant, who assisted him at the dedication, and only because his name was the same as that of the southern pillar. The working tools of an entered apprentice Freemason are those used to prepare the stone for the hands of the more expert workmen, but the working tools of the second degree, the square, the level, and the plum, are the tools of the expert craftsmen, the skilled mason responsible for the correct interpretation of the architect's designs, and for their faithful execution in the building. His, therefore, are the most important of all the tools, and the charge in which they are presented to the candidate is probably the most inspiring in all of our Masonic ritual. The candidate who really absorbs his philosophy can hardly fail to become a worthy Freemason. Let me now present to you the tools in reverse order. The plumb rule, giving us the true vertical line, is the emblem of integrity, which embraces the attributes of kindness, moderation, justice, and truth, the essential virtues of the just, upright, and steadfast man, of whom the Roman poet Horace, over 2,000 years ago, wrote, The man of firm and righteous will, no rabble clamorous for the wrong, nor tyrant's brow, whose frown may kill, can shake the power that makes him strong. Odes 111, 3, 1-4. The level, giving us a true horizontal line, is the emblem of equality, and teaches that all men are equal, inasmuch as they are subject to the same infirmities, all hastening to the same goal, and all to be judged by the same immutable law, regardless of race, color, creed, or tongue. In this sense, the level is the perfect emblem of brotherhood. Thus, the plum rule gives us the true vertical line, and the level gives us the true horizontal line. And when the true vertical and the true horizontal meet, they form an angle of 90 degrees, or the fourth part of a circle, which, of course, is the square. Now we see that the level and plum rule are complementary to the square, and understand the reason that these tools are worn by the three principal officers, the master and his two wardens. And that brings us to the square. But we have already mentioned it when we dealt with the opening of the lodge. However, there are two comments that could be added at this juncture. In the earliest known Masonic catechism, there is a question, how many make a lodge? And the answer is given as, God in the square and five or seven right or perfect Masons. This sounds like a riddle, but it is easily explained. God in the square, knowing the meaning of the square, we are immediately reminded of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. To love God and our neighbor is to keep all the commandments, which, of course, is what Christ meant when he said, on these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. And now for the rest of the answer, with five or seven right or perfect masons. Five is right and seven is perfect, because five hold a lodge, and so five is the right number to form a Masonic quorum. And seven is perfect, because, as the first tracing board tells us, that is the number of regularly made masons without which number no lodge is perfect. The second comment is that in the year 1830, when a very ancient bridge was being rebuilt near Limerick in Ireland, the architect found under the foundation stone an old corroded brass square with this inscription, which is cited in the builders on page 56. I will strive to live with loving care upon the level and by the square. We will deal with just one thing in the tracing board, which has been purposely left to the end, and that is the winding staircase, which, as I have already claimed, is the greatest symbol in the fellow craft degree. Its seven steps, the seven liberal arts and sciences, grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy, symbolize the ultimate attainment of the fellow craft mason, starting from the very beginning of man's intellectual progress. Our first intellectual advance is made possible by the development of language, thus enabling us to communicate with our neighbor, and so widen the field of our knowledge, which would otherwise be restricted to our own personal experience. Grammar is the foundation of language, and so it must be the first step on the intellectual ladder. It is not enough, however, to master the structure of the language. We must be able to put it into practice, and the art which teaches us to speak copiously and fluently on a subject is rhetoric. And so we move to the second step. Even the most grammatically correct and skillfully delivered language is just an empty senseless flow of words unless it contains logic. And so we continue to rise to the third step. Having climbed these three steps, we are then equipped to exchange knowledge with our neighbor. The fellow craft were paid their wages in specie, that is, coin or money, which here is the symbol for knowledge, because knowledge, like money, increases with usage and exchange. The exchange of knowledge enables us to compare, to compare what we know with what our neighbor knows. The science of comparison is arithmetic. Its ciphers and measurements are but the means that it uses. And so arithmetic, the fourth step, symbolizes the beginning of knowledge. 
Our acquisition of knowledge brings us to step number five, the predominating number of this degree, and there we find geometry, which is established as the basis of our art. Geometry, the science of harmony and space, presides over everything. We find it in the arrangement of a fir cone, in the spiral of a snail shell, in the chaplet of a spider's web, in the orbit of a planet. It is everywhere, as perfect in the world of atoms as in the world of immensities. The snowflake is a perfect example of geometry of God. Circles, triangles, pentagrams, hexagons, and parallelograms. More exact and delicate than the deftest hand could trace. And the universal geometry tells us of a universal geometrician, whose divine compasses have measured all things. And so we realize that the development of the intellectual faculty is assuredly leading us even to the throne of God. Then geometry leads us to the next step, because music is the geometry of sound. Every note in a musical scale is exactly double the wavelength of the corresponding note in the preceding octave, and each note in a chord is a logarithmic progression. Music moves with measured step and cannot free itself from the geometry without dying away in discord. Music is the concord of sweet sounds. The concord is all the law of God. Geometry brought us close to God, but music brings us still closer. As Byron put it, there is music in the sighing of the breeze. There is music in the gushing of a stream. There is music in all things, if men have ears. This earth is but an echo of the spheres. Seven is the number of completion, and on the seventh and uppermost step we find astronomy, by which we are taught to read the wisdom, power, and goodness of the grand geometrician of the universe in the wonder of the heavens. With the aid of astronomy we may observe the motions of the heavenly bodies. We may measure their distances and calculate their periods and eclipses but our finite minds may not even hope to comprehend the magnitude of God's handiwork. In the words of the poet Dryden, How can the less greater comprehend, or finite reason reach infinity? Reach infinity? We cannot even contemplate it. We can, however, extend our researches into the hidden mysteries of nature and science. So let us do just that, and merely contemplate the magnitude of God's handiwork, and see how far our finite mind can extend. For example, to travel the enormous distance of one million kilometers, we would completely circle the Earth 25 times. And if we could maintain a constant speed of 114 kilometers per hour, it would take us the whole year to complete this journey. And yet the speed of light is so great that it can traverse one million kilometers in a fraction over three seconds. If we could travel at that impossible speed for just eight minutes, we could reach the sun, a distance of 154 million kilometers. But to reach the outer edge of our own home galaxy, the Milky Way, we would need to maintain this fantastic speed for 80,000 years. It is quite impossible, of course, for us to comprehend the extent of 80,000 years, having no experience with which to make a comparison. Suffice it to say that just one-tenth of that period would take us back to the year 6017 BC, before the Nile Valley was settled by the people who would later build the pyramids, the oldest construction in the world. Then, when we consider that this galaxy, whose magnitude is so far beyond our comprehension, it is just a tiny speck in the known universe, our finite mind is completely overwhelmed. And beyond the known universe stretches the vaster unknown, of which we are but dimly aware through our most powerful modern telescopes receiving light that started on its journey before this planet was even born. All this vaster than vast universe, with its incalculable billions of stars, each many millions of times the size of this earth, moves and revolves in obedience to a great unseen power, with a precision that is perfect. No, we can never hope to comprehend, but it is here, on the seventh step of the winding staircase, that we may really contemplate the wonderful works of the Almighty Creator. As fellow craft Freemasons, we are expected to make the liberal arts and sciences our constant study that we may better be enabled to discharge our duty as Freemasons, and estimate the wonderful works of the Almighty Creator. When we reach the uppermost step of the winding staircase, astronomy conducts us through the paths of the heavenly science, till we stand at the very foot of the throne of God, of which we are yet granted but the merest glimpse. We tread its steps one by one, ever onward, ever upward, without moving away from the center, that point which we cannot err with the horizons ever widening, but the way ahead is always out of sight. Then we reach the door of the middle chamber, which we find open. It is open only because the experience of the climb has trained our mind to see God in his universe. So we enter to find the letter G. 
Brethren, it is only by climbing these stairs, it is only by developing the intellectual faculty, that we may reach the summit and find the letter G in the middle chamber. That is to find God in our own hearts, and to be filled with the consciousness of his infinite wisdom, of his incomprehensible power, his boundless love and mercy, and the awesome eternity of the time and space of his universe. When we can do this, we have completed our journey through the second degree. It is then, and only then, that we can claim to be fellow craft masons.